All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first collection close-up program at the Francis Willard House Museum. Uh, my name is Fiona Maxwell. I am the Director of Museum Operations and Communications at the Willard House, and I'm a PhD candidate in history at the University of Chicago. Uh, today's program uh, has come out of a tradition of virtual programs that we began at towards the beginning of the pandemic called Handicraft Hours, where we would bring small groups together to work on handicraft together and learn about um, items in our collection that pertain to some aspect of women's creativity. Um, this year, our program theme is addressing women's education um, because we are nearing the 150th anniversary of Frances Willard's role of uh, as the Dean of Women at Northwestern University. Um, as such, we are devoting all of our programs to the theme, Knowledge is Power, Women in Education. And so Collection Close-Up is sort of the next generation of Handicraft Hour that is now taking on um, the broader program theme of the museum. And so we are uh, spending uh, the coming program year using our Collection Close-Ups to zoom in on um, items in our collections that help to tell that education story. And we are going to begin chronologically with uh, Francis Willard's childhood writing. So Francis Willard really affected change on the international scale as a social reformer through her words, through her skill as a writer and as a speaker. But her linguistic skill was not something that she kind of turned to once she knew that she wanted to be involved in social reform. These were skills that she actually developed for their own sake as a young person in more creative channels. Um, so. There are many sources in the Willard House's archives that were produced by Frances Willard when she was a young girl. Um, today, we're gonna to be focusing on Rupert Melville and his comrades, Story of Adventure, a novel that she began writing in her early teens. We have the entire 165 page unfinished manuscript in our archive. Um, and it is very unusual in that it is a child produced source from the 1850s. Um, it is perhaps even more significant in that it show, gives us a glimpse into how Willard started to hone these um, expressive skills as a young person while growing up at our, in our pretty isolated Wisconsin farm. Uh, so today we'll go through the context that led Willard to create her novel. Um, we'll talk about the inspirations that influenced the content and then look at how Willard used it to um, activate her imaginations uh, in basically the dramatic realm through speaking and act and, and dramatization and play. And then we'll talk about what significance this has for Willard's future and for um, kind of women's reform work and education in general. So uh, it is important to, to know right at the outset kind of what was Willard's educational and literary ecosystem as a child. Um, she spent most of her childhood and uh, teenagerhood at Forest Home, which was her farmhouse located near uh, Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin was still very sparsely settled at this point, and uh, Willard did not have a lot of close neighbors. There was no school in the district, and so her education was really superintended by her mother, and her most of her social interaction was with her immediate family, um, as well as the other folks who worked on the farm and, and a few neighborhood uh, families. So uh, just because Willard was primarily educated at home uh, as a child does not mean that her education was necessarily limited. Her mother, Mary Thompson Hill Willard, um, pictured here on the left, had been a school teacher for 11 years before her marriage. And she was by all accounts, very accomplished and sensitive teacher and likely did a very good job in educating her children. Um, her other family members included her father, Josiah, her older brother, Oliver, and her younger sister, Mary Eliza. Oliver had the opportunity to go away from home and study at school and at college, um, but the two girls spent their early years entirely learning uh, from their mother. When Frances turned 14, her father uh, helped uh, with, um, joined uh, in an effort with other men of the area to establish the first schoolhouse in the district. This was a very tiny one-room schoolhouse, um, but Frances Willard recalled that this was such an important step in her life that going to school um, represented her first step into the wider world beyond the home and it also marked her initiation as a true scholar. So Willard's education was influenced first and foremost by her family, also by some neighborhood mentors like some women who she would bring um, 
you know, writing to just to share it and get their feedback, as well as, of course, her school master when she did start going to school. But her education was also quite self-directed, especially starting at the age of 12. At that age, Willard began to keep a journal, and every day after she finished her farm chore, she would climb up to what she called my perch in the old oak tree on her farm, and she wrote that she would write down the day's proceedings, scribble sketches and verses, and eventually began her novel, Rupert Melville and His Comrades, A Story of Adventure. It might come as a bit of a surprise that for a woman who we associate with the women's rights movement and with leading the largest women's organization of the 19th century, the WCTU, that um, as a child, Willard's story was actually had an all-male cast of characters. Um, this is because her chief reading matter consisted of adventure stories. And um, I think it's important to note that Willard was someone who, as a child, was very much excited by um, outdoor play and um, kind of this sort of more adventurous style of stories. And she was not all that interested in what was typically associated with little girls like handicraft and sewing and, and that sort of thing. Um, she was quite aware of how her brother was allowed to do things at the farm that she was not allowed to do. For example, he was allowed to ride the horse and she was told that it was not safe for her to do the same thing. So being Frances Willard, she saddled up the family cow and rode the cow around the farm just to show that she was quite cap capable of doing anything her brother was able to do. Um, this experience of comparing um, her rights to her brother's eventually expanded into he gets to go away to school and I don't. He gets to go off and vote and I don't. So this was something that was really at the top of her mind. Um, and in her consumption of fiction and eventually her writing endeavors, this theme is really present because at the time she uh, wrote in her journal that, you know, she didn't want to be a boy or a man, but she wanted a boy's advantages. And um, imagination was one way uh, that she was able to kind of get a taste of that. So this desire to create the story of these adventurous comrades um, came out of her secret reading of three storybooks. Uh, she got a hold of Charles Augustus Murray's The Prairie Bird, John Beauchamp's Jones' Wild Western Scenes, and Daniel Pierce Thompson's The Green Mountain Boys. And she said that she secretly devoured all three without leave or license, which was a rather scandalous thing to do because she was from a devout Methodist family and her father actually quite disapproved of novel reading, especially any stories that uh, contained romance or sensationalism um, and basically a lot of the things that were in these stories. So how she exactly managed to procure these and keep them secret, I'm not sure. Um, but she did have a sense of, of daring about actually reading these books. Um, not that there was actually anything to modern readers that would be considered that scandalous. Um, so in terms of the content of these stories that she became so enamored with, um, these were set in the late 18th century. Um, many of them were set in what was then the Northwest Territory, which Willard identified as a resident of the Northwest Territory, um, which encompassed Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana and Michigan and parts of Ohio. And, um, you know, major themes include conflict and interaction with Native Americans, of course, um, as well as fighting wild animals and all sorts of daring deeds. Um, I have here a lithograph from the prairie bird that shows a woman engaged in a conversation with a Native American man and she's on a horse. Looks like she's kind of playing an active role in the story. Now, um, but this was not all always true in these stories. So these are all lithographs from the Daniel Boone stories that Willard, Willard was a particular fan of Daniel Boone. And um, you'll see that uh, Boone gets to be, you know, off being the hero and returning perhaps injured um, to the uh, to the town, and what is the woman's role? The woman's role is to kind of lean on his arm and to fawn and to take care of him. And so, when Willard is considering these cast of characters in these Western stories, she decides that she doesn't want to be the girl hanging onto his arm. She wants to be Daniel Boone. She wants to be out there having these adventures. Um, so, she remembered and wrote uh, later that these stories produced on my imagination the same effect that they would upon a boy's. So this love of adventure is not limited just to boys. Girls have a sense of adventure too. And she concluded, above all things in earth or sky, I wanted to be and meant to be a mighty hunter. So at the age of about 12 to 14, she decided that her future career path, she was gonna be Daniel Boone, literally. 
And her first step was writing Rupert Melville. Um, now we have, as I said, all the pages that she produced of this novel. Um, however, they are extremely hard to read. We have PDF scans, um, but Willard of course had difficult to read handwriting. Some of the pages are stuck together. Um, so the archives are currently contemplating launching a transcription project, which I think would be amazing because uh, we can actually get kind of access to Willard's words and her story at such a young age. But we can access a bit of what Rupert involved and what it meant to her through looking at how she transformed it into a performance piece on her farm. So um, let's see, before we get to that, I'll leave it here. Um, Rupert became an active performance once Willard decided she was going to share the text with her family and her neighbors. She talked so much about Rupert and his adventures that her novel became what she called a standing joke in the family. It came to have so many characters that her older brother Oliver told her that for the life of him, he didn't see how I expected to get them all decently killed off inside of a thousand pages. Perhaps not all the characters are dead because she only made it up to 165. Um, now, this was a very disciplined effort. Uh, she uh, remembered that she made herself write at least one page handwritten um, after she finished her chores every day, and she would reward herself by performing it aloud. So she read each chapter out loud as fast as it was written, and her um, biggest fan, at least in her mind, was um, Lizzie Hawley, who was a dressmaker from Janesville who came and stayed with the family every so often to do up the new clothes for the girls. Um, but later, Willard reflected that perhaps the reason why Lizzie listened so dutifully was because she had no choice, that, you know, she was paid to fit Willard's dress, and Willard had the story in her hands and was talking, 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 and of course, as Willard later wrote, the busy needlewoman could not get away. So the next step in bringing Rupert to life was handicraft. Um, Willard's little sister, Mary Eliza, was... Um, a very uh, passionate visual artist. Um, and she had an enthusiasm for adventure as well, but she never really read these Western stories. She, she kind of went so far as Swiss Family Robinson and, and stopped. Um, but she was more than happy to help Willard uh, create Rupert as a character. And so they formed two clubs together, uh, the Artists Club and the Rustics Club. Uh, and these two clubs would combine their interests in adventure and in art. So to begin with the artist club, uh, the girls elected themselves uh, president and secretary. They spent a lot of time reading papers aloud about art, and they also took on projects. And their first project was to create a costume, a hunter's costume for Rupert Melville. Um, and Willard was starting to realize that it might be that she was not actually going to get to go west and become a hunter like Daniel Boone. Um, but she decided that somebody was going to, and so thus she would supply the costume. Uh, and now this costume Willard wrote was none of your soft city clothes. It was designed one, to stand, wear, and tear, two, to not take forever to put on, and three, be snake proof. So it consisted of a coat, trousers, hats, mittens, and boots. And by 1889, when Willard was compiling her autobiography, uh, she still had these drawings. I don't think we still have these anymore, sadly but they were apparently very colorful and they contained emphatic directions for the manufacturer. So if we could find these, someone could actually finally make a Rupert costume. The second club was the Rustic Club. And this was how the girls really brought Rupert and his adventures to life. Um, this club was all about adventure and playing outside. And so they would go off on these um, adventures together and they always brought their dog, Fred, and sometimes the girls brought their dog, Carlo, but he was a bit of a handful. So they had to make sure that he was in a mood where he had sense enough, as they put it. Um, in addition to their adventuring, then they held indoor meetings. Um, and these were filled with telling stories about, quote, what great things we have done ourselves or that Oliver, their brother or other neighborhood boys had done, or just telling stories about Daniel Boone or others like Rupert Melville. Um, they adopted hunter names. So Francis became Bowman and Mary Eliza became Bonnie. And they decided on all sorts of signals so they could communicate at distances, um, telling each other things like, meet me at Robin Hood's tree. So to conclude, uh, when Willard turned 16, she began to think a little bit more seriously about her future. And she wrote in her journal all the things that thus far she had thought she might like to be when she grew up. And at first she wanted to be Queen Victoria's maid of honor until she realized that she was American and probably would not be eligible. Uh, she contemplated living in Cuba. She contemplated being an artist. 
And most recently, she had really had her heart set on becoming Rupert Melville, a mighty hunter of the prairies. But at the age of 16, she began to think perhaps her fate lie more where a lot of other girls were headed, which was to become a school teacher. And at that time, she wrote kind of frustratedly, um, simply that and nothing more. Now, as we are exploring in our Knowledge is Power series, becoming a teacher is no small feat. And it's, of course, an extremely important position. It's a position that Willard held for 12 years. Um, and eventually that led her to become a higher education leader in Evanston and really push the boundaries of women's higher education. But at 16, she also started to think more seriously about writing and speaking. Um, and she reflected on her experience with creating Rupert Melville and with bringing him to life through all these games. And she made up her mind that, quote, write I could and should and would. And it was really these verbal skills, both written and spoken, that allowed her to move into then social reform on the global scale um, and that allowed her to use her words, both written and spoken, to change the world. All right, so here we have Willard at work as an adult with her many, many papers on her desk at the Willard House. And I will uh, leave the presentation off there. Um, for our asynchronous viewers on YouTube, if you have questions, feel free to comment or to email us at info at francisfullardhouse.org. I invite everyone to look at our website um, for more information about the women's education story on our blog is the primary method of reading more. Um, but for now, I will stop recording and I will open up the floor for a conversation.